Um, right, we've got Graham Hunter with us, I think. Yeah. Graham, good morning to you. Morning, oh. lads. What's the crack? How are you? Yeah, super. Yeah, just back from some uh, filming in Valencia and Sabel with filming in Bilbao to come this week. But the Champions League in the middle with Barca under pressure. I mean, the the Barcelona story is incredible. The Real Madrid story is pretty incredible. And the fact that so many names being linked with the Man United job have some kind of Spanish connection means that um, this is quite a delicious period. Jurgen Klopp said he hated the international break. We we actually quite enjoyed the international break for a change. I suspect maybe you did too. The atmosphere... Loved, that... it, for, loved it for several reasons. You're obviously referring to Spain and their ease of qualification. There's no hint about you even mentioning mighty Scotland and the way in which we demolished the world's unofficially number one ranked in Denmark. Yeah, look, the international break this time I thought was um, particularly vibrant. And you know, I find myself uh, deeply intellectually challenged for about the 10 millionth time uh, talking to you two in that I hate the way that we treat our footballers. I hate the way we treat them as commodities and squeeze every last drop of physical availability and also mental creativity out of them. We're, we're treating them somewhere between cattle and products. Yet I am one of those that the more football I see the more that's available, the more I get a chance to go to games, talk to footballers after games, the happier I am. So I accept the contradiction. But um, if you give me a, a chance just to glimpse at the Scotland side, I, I was sitting on Friday night with ex-Scotland manager Craig Brown. He couldn't remember a game where he'd either been working or watching, but he'd seen Scotland play better. And he meant it at 81, but he couldn't remember a better performance than the one against Denmark. Maybe that's a little bit exaggerated, but the quality of football was absolutely superb. And the atmosphere. Being well coached. To, to have, after the two years that we've been through, to have fans back initially was brilliant. To have fan back, fans back initially for Scotland was a mixed blessing because there were deep doubts about um, the quality of football, the progress over the last six, seven, eight, nine years, easily. To go from where there was a fervour for Scotland being represented in a tournament again in summer, mm. but, but clear gaps about how to handle the bigger sides, how to handle sides that wanted to attack you. To now, where the learning has been ultra rapid, right across the technical staff and the squad, there's a clear understanding of how to play against bigger, better teams. Not necessarily turn them over, we're not suddenly world beaters, but the tactical nows, but then the confidence and that's tr transmitted to fans. The hand was jam-packed full. Yes, the atmosphere was brilliant. But I tuned in only on television this time to the game the next day where Wales were playing in Cardiff Stadium. And the atmosphere there was absolutely roasting. It was so good. So to, to have teams that matter to me playing well in front of full houses, it's something that seems next to a dream, next to impossible after... So many years of a dearth of success for Scotland, but then two years without crowds in stadia, it's just fantastic. That's been played well. Don't forget Spain played well. And and over the next four, five, six years, I would expect Spain to be in, in direct competition to lift trophies. Well, they've got a, a slew of young kids, who many of whom are coming through at, at Barca at the moment. Um, and we'll talk about that in a minute. But the, the Spain job in particular, if I think if we could all tap Ronald Koeman on the shoulder and say, don't, don't, don't leave. Don't take that job. It, it's a, a poison chalice and you're doing really well at the moment. If you just stay with, with the Dutch, you're going to have a good time. He, he didn't. I, I suspect Luis Enrique is not as stupid as, uh, as Koeman and will not be in any way interested or entertained by the prospect of taking the Man United job, even though apparently he is he is Ronaldo's chosen successor. Is there anything in this at all? Anything beyond yeah. a flight of fancy? I know that you've lit the blue touch paper and you're now standing well back. I know you know how much I think the story is, is garbage. I don't know where it came from. And if somebody has spoken to Cristiano Ronaldo or directly to George Mendes, who tends to be his mouthpiece, and this is coming from them, then it's the most bizarre story ever. And I'll tell you why. Before we even look at what Luis Enrique Martinez might or might not do, if you've watched his football from the very days that he took over at Barca B, the, the moderate season at Roma, what he did at Celta, Barcelona, onwards to Spain, 
Cristiano Ronaldo right now is the uh, epitome of the type of footballer that Luis Enrique doesn't want in his team. He's not particularly attracted to stars in the first place. But right across the board, whoever you are, however much he has liked you, however much he hasn't liked you, but you're vital. If you're not running and pressing and working and trying to win the ball back, anytime his team loses to Ricky's team, doesn't have the ball, you're out. That's it. Goodbye. And, and possibly goodbye forever. And at the moment, and probably for the last few years, increasingly since the success of Barcelona, he's, he's ultra about his own beliefs. It's not as if he was a flip-flopper before, but like you probably get one warning um, and then you and then you're out. Now imagine in some ludicrous world, Lisson making leaves Spain, takes over at Manchester United. Cristiano Ronaldo is is getting maybe getting biscuit crumb minutes at the end of games, not because of any personal antipathy. But because Luis Enrique believes in a particular style that Cristiano Ronaldo, because of his age, cannot fulfil. So, also there's something that needs to be said. Cristiano Ronaldo, for whatever you think about him, is 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 football bright and is very shrewd, street smart, street smart about his own career. The idea that he might be saying, "I want this guy to come to the club where I'm working," in the full knowledge that he'd be dropped, it's just honestly, it's. Can the whole I, concept stinks of rotten fish. Okay. Does the concept of Guardiola wanting Ronaldo in the summer also stink of rotten fish by the same criteria? Was that true? I can't remember if I can't remember if we talked I don't on think this we did. show or or not. But for my taste, um and I got some nudges, I got some help on this. It it was a corporate thing, it was a, a club idea. Um I say two things. Three things. One, Cristiano Ronaldo is in no way responsible for the mess that Manchester United are in right now. Two, at the time he signed for Manchester United with Alex Ferguson's intervention, everybody was hailing it as a, a, a great coup. So at the time when Manchester City wanted him, you, you can vouch for the concept or not analytically. You, the viewers, I can do it too. You can say, good idea, bad idea in sporting terms. But could you see it in commercial terms? Could you see it in City being able to wave two fingers up at Manchester United, could you see it in terms of attracting more attention to City? Yeah, you could see it. One thing that Pep Guardiola has said continuously throughout his career, he will go and object about things he doesn't like to his employers, but there's been a constant mantra of, I'm an employee. He's had to do things across his career that he hasn't particularly liked or enjoyed, and there will come a stage just like Luis Enrique, and I see the jump that you make because of the way both of them like to play, the fact that you know maybe City do lack a, a scorer because they couldn't get gain, all this kind of stuff. To, to my mind, it was a City project with very little interest from Pep Guardiola in it. But Luis Enrique and Guardiola are not the same man. Luis Enrique is much, much, much more hawkish than Pep, believe me. Right, interesting, because it, it didn't seem like it, it would make sense. And it's a terrible idea for, for him. I know the money might be more, but like, go and win your World Cup, either now or the next one, and then whatever job you want is yours for life, and you can you can name your paycheck. And it's not like he needs the money anyway. So um, what Zidane, not going to happen? A good idea, a bad idea? What do you think? Look, number one, in tactical terms, one of the things that's really, really important about Zidane is that he is the player whisperer, he is the guy who can go to either slightly out of form, slightly misunderstood, perhaps slightly jaded, great players, and talk them through the the rehabilitation, who, who can ensure that there's a, a daily climate set where very good and great players thrive. I don't think he has ever tried to masquerade as, as one of these obsessive strategy tactical coaches. He fits into the bracket of, of what and was a different age between you, you two and me, but we all grew up in Britain and Ireland with the, much more of a concept of manager, somebody who managed the squad to be a coach to his side, two or three coaches sometimes, but the manager managed them, was really good at the dressing room, with atmosphere, with orders, with setting a tone. That's Zidane, and that you will know better than me is not what Manchester United need right now. They need crystal clear. They need 
one of these intensive in interventionist coaches who says, this is the way we're playing. You're not doing that anymore. We need to do that. The space between all these things that we've become used to, to, to saying, and none of these names, I mean individually, but there's a bracket of uh, Unai Emery, Lopetegui, Benitez, Pep Guardiola, Luis Enrique, coaches who are like, this is the way it's going to be. There'll, there'll be no um, Conte. I mean, it is, it's one of the great on goals of modern times that if United were on the point of saying one bad defeat and so spurs out, that they didn't just go and get Conte. It's, it, it defies belief. So Zidane is a concept that Manchester United I think would be likely to be an ill fit with what they need and what he's offering. He wants the Paris Saint-Germain job. I now don't have much doubt that Pochettino will somehow goad um, Leonardo, the ultra-irascible, ultra-pompous PSG sports director, to a point where they're willing to let him go. And I, I'd now be a little bit surprised, personally, if it's not Pochettino to Manchester United at some stage, depending on how accelerated that can become, and Zidane to Paris Saint-Germain. And, and do you still maintain, Graham, then, that missing out on Conte would have been... is, is, is a bad moment for, for Manchester United? You have Conte in a, in a level above Pochettino. I have I have them as different. Um, I think another evolution in, in, in the coaching market in recent years to do with many more billionaire foreign owners across Europe where patience is short. The Abramovich model having been seen and copied by equivalent elite clubs around Europe. There are managers, Ancelotti is one, uh, Conte is another, where you're betting that what you get is a two, maybe maximum three-year infusion of caffeine, where all standards are changed, where the daily intensity can bring burnout, but will almost always bring massive improvements. Um, no real attention paid to whether academy players can come through or not. It's all about win this second, win this hour, win this day, win this month, win this season, win trophies. Everything is now, now, now. Ultra, ultra hothouse intensive. Conte is that. Then the likelihood is that he'll ask too much upwards he doesn't manage upwards particularly well. It's it's these are my standards. I want this player, that player. If you can't bring him, then I'm out of here. And and that's precisely what United need right now. It, it, it's he was the identicate of what they needed. He probably wasn't the five year, six year man. Pochettino might be. He's clearly a developer. He is a good coach. Um, he clearly has. Um, footballing ideas within his skill set that match with the general image that the fans and the sponsors have of the club. Let, let's leave Ed Woodward out of this argument because it's incredible that people are still talking about what should be done at Manchester United and Mourinho was this and Vergara was this and the players. and it, It's Woodward. Couldn't be, couldn't be more simple. You can't sack the owners. They're at fault here. Woodward has been a disastrous presence for, Man presence for Manchester United. But within the scope of that not being something that's imminently going to change, in fact, he's so good at his job, he's apparently going to stay on and oversee all these successor. Good move, United. Fantastic. Yeah, salute that. Um, Pochettino is patently somebody around whom there are doubts. One of the things I've said on your show before, but when Bayern Munich were scouting him as a potential replacement for... Uh, who was a Croat manager, um, at any rate, the Croatian manager that they needed to replace, and they did do with Flick. They 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 looked at him, Salah Hamidzic, watched Pochettino really closely and said, he's, he's slow to make changes within games. You see a situation, he's conservative, he's a bit reactive. We want... So there are things there, there are things about how soon he allays the idea about trophy winning in a place where it's not you know, shooting fish in a, in a barrel like it is at Paris Saint-Germain. Personally, um, I think that if you if you only look at the little flaws, the little Achilles heels, and ignore the talent, then that's a mistake. And Pochettino would be the, the longer term, the developing coach, where if it clicks, you can imagine being there for five, six years, which, which sets him apart from Conte in personality and attitude and daily regime, 
but it, but if you want accelerated change, immediate impact, it was Conte. Right. And obviously that's gone now. So they're left with Pochettino. There aren't, it doesn't seem like a million other viable candidates because, you know, you can give the job to Brendan Rodgers, fair enough, but like Leicester aren't doing great hold at on, the moment. Hold on, hold on, viable candidates. What does that mean? They, they missed they missed a trick. Right. I've got back to my Woodward argument because you, you've, you've dangled a, you know, red rag. Irrespective of, of what kind of job Darren Fletcher is going to do there, he's he, He's rather new in the door. What you're getting is agents influencing Woodward. They've missed three huge tricks at United. The first one was Ancelotti. Ancelotti was going back to Real Madrid. The idea of saying to him, we know that you can manage in situations where it's as difficult, for example, under Berlusconi, as it is under the Glazers and Woodward. Woodward. It, 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 it's, he also has the, the wisdom and the solutions to alter things, to make the, they would not be in the situation they're in now if they tired Ancelotti. The other trick they've missed is Conte, we talked about him. And for my taste, the trick they've missed is Xavi. Because Xavi is extraordinary, um, speaks English perfectly, and is going to be outrageous. He's going to be an outrageously talented coach and manager. And for my taste, that won't always be at Barcelona. They'll come a stage. And that's one of the things that I would done. People now are looking at um, it has to be tried and tested. I don't think that's true. And Javi is so talented and he was available and you could have you could have given Barcelona a bloody nose. And at the moment Barcelona and Manchester United aren't as 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 nose to nose rivals as they were for five or six years between two thousand and eight and twenty eleven, twenty twelve, twenty thirteen. However, those those two tricks are missed and and, and and, you know, laugh off, Chad, if you disagree with Conte, if you disagree with Ancelotti, because oh, we had a couple of bad months at Everton. <laughs> but the truth is, it's evidence of, uh, allied to the way that they're thrashing around right now, it's evidence of how poor Woodward's grasp of needing to have a proper strategy is and, and how poorly he consults. You know, it's, it's something that is deeply frustrating. And if it... It begins to cost the the jobs or the futures of potentially really important men to Manchester United, like Car- like like Fletcher, because there's an overhaul coming. Then that will be another own goal. And um, to, to to my mind, the idea that fans at United want to protest about the Glazers is, is is important, but probably futile in the meantime because they're only selling for what they think to be is is a massive profit or a financial incentive that is better than the one that's staying. Woodward is, is is the weak man, he's the weak link, he is the problem, and that's where the protest should be aimed. Yeah, it's, and, and look, he says he's on the way out. Um, he says he'll consult even if the hunt for the new manager goes beyond the time he's supposed to leave the club, which is it's good of him, decent of him to um, to stay involved. We're, we're totally out of time, Graham, but um, Barca against Benfica tonight. Uh, Javi started with a win. Every single match at the moment is a cup final in terms of trying to get out of that group because they started so badly. Can he do it? Can they dig themselves out of that hole? Yeah, it's a proper cup final because if they win the through, and that's a 60 million win and the confidence. They've got injuries that are even worse than they were last weekend. They can do it. I think there's slight odds against winning against Benfica, but they've got extraordinary young footballers. I think De Jong is going to score tonight. I think the Barcelona going to have a chance. They need to draw to keep it alive for the last game, which is a walk in the park somewhere down in Munich against Bayern. So let's hope at least it's alive so that we can do this again just before match day six. And Villarreal, uh, there's a good chance they actually beat Man United tonight, right? The bookies don't agree with you, and the reason for that is that Paco Alcacer is very likely out. General Moreno is out. There are injuries left, right and centre across the Villarreal squad. Unai Emery is having the oddest of seasons whereby if it wasn't for a couple of decent wins, they'd be down touching the relegation zone. They're good enough to beat Manchester United. They definitely are. Um, I have no idea what impact Michael Carrick will have on United, so I don't want to call the result of the game. But the bookies say that VRL are distinctly second favourites at home at the Madrigal against even this wobbly Manchester United. And I guess nobody would be up shocked if Villarreal rallied are difficult to beat and some Portuguese guys pops up in the 98th minute to score a winner. Let's oh, see. Well, that's why we watch, because we don't know the results. Graham, great to have you with us. Thanks a million. Cheers.